so much, Debasis, and thank you for the invitation. It's a great pleasure to give the SMCD Center seminar today. And thank you, everybody, for coming, for you know, taking time out of your Friday afternoon, assuming it's Friday afternoon, <laughs> wherever you are, uh, to come for the talk. Uh, let me share my screen. While I do that, uh, just as Debasis said, Please, uh, you know, let's keep this uh, friendly and informal. Feel free to ask questions uh, during the presentation by just typing them either in the chat or in the q and I, uh, I have my eye on both. We've all gotten <laughs> fluent in, you know, Zoom and all its features over the last year. Uh, so I'm a roboticist and uh, in particular, one of the kinds of motor ro robot motor skill that I focus on is manipulation, dextrous manipulation. And one of the fun things about doing robotics is that you get to worry about everything from the hardware of the robot, you know, the body, if you wish, the kinematics, the actuation, then of course the sensing, uh, and then what's typically considered the intelligence part of the robot, things that fall into modeling or planning, learning control, and so on. And uh, in our lab, we work on all of these. Uh, we feel that it's one of our strengths that we do have this broad overview spanning the mechanical and the computational aspects of robotics. But since this is the uh, sense, move, and collect data seminar, my focus for today is specifically on the sensing aspects of robotics and robotic manipulation in particular. And uh, one thing that I like to point out is that, you know, when you think about large scale distributed sensing mechanisms, people tend to think of things that, you know, span hundreds of miles geographically. But you don't need to go that far to find a sensing system with hundreds of thousands of sensors, highly distributed, and with a lot of intelligence baked into the sensing itself. Uh, if you just look at the peripheral nervous system, we, of which you know my understanding of it is, you know, I'm an engineer, I'm not a you know a biologist by any means. But still, I can appreciate the amazing complexity and you know this highly distributed incredibly rich multimodal uh, sensing system that is the human peripheral nervous system. Uh, if you think just that two sensing modalities that are particularly interesting to me because they pertain to motor skills, just uh, tactile sensing, we have this incredibly rich uh, system for, for tactile sensing hundreds of individual mechanoreceptors per centimeter square in the fingertip and different types of mechanoreceptors, all of them attuned to different types of signals, fast acting, low acting. Uh, and then if you think about proprioception, so the ability to sense your own body's position in space, uh, we have muscle spindles that give us information about what, what our own muscles are doing. We have the Golgi tendon organs. So all in all, just, you know, back of the envelope, our body collects individual signals from, you know, more than 100,000 tactile and proprioceptive sensors all the time. And we use that information, we collect it, part of it goes to the spine, to the brain, it gets collected, and it is the uh, sensory source of all the incredible motor skills that we have as people. So I'm, I'm fascinated by the sensing capabilities, you know, the peripheral nervous system and the sensing capabilities of the human body. And, uh, you know, I, I, I say often that, you know, I, I would so love to have similar capabilities in my robots. I, I lust for the tactile sensing capabilities of, of people, the richness of the data. Uh, and it's not just how incredibly rich the, the tactile data is that, that people get, you know, hundreds of mechanoreceptors. It's also that Think about the coverage, right? We have tactile sensing abilities all over our fingers on the backs of our joints. We have this wonderful accordion structure that stretches as the joint flexes and then you know compresses as the joint extends. So everything is sensorized and everything is you know integrated with the body. All of those signals get collected somehow they don't corrupt each other. So we would love in robot hands 
to have similarly rich contact data. But the caveat is that we have to have the ability to cover complex curved surfaces and we need our tactile sensing modalities to be easy to integrate into actual robot hands. A tactile sensor that has a thousand wires coming out of it and needs to be connected to you know, a 1000 volt power source isn't all that useful in, an, in a robot. It's good on a workbench. You can demonstrate it. You cannot integrate it. Uh, so that's what we set out to build quite a few years ago in collaboration with, uh, with John Kimisis's lab, with the Clue lab. And uh, let me walk you through the approach that we took to building our own tactile sensors. And uh, I'm going to build this from the ground up, starting from you know, just the, the very basic principles that we looked at. So imagine for a second a tactile sensor. The gray slab here represents a tactile sensor. And somewhere in this tactile sensor, we are embedding two terminals. I'm going to keep it vague for now what those terminals are. The important thing is that there is some signal that we can measure between those two terminals. Maybe the signal is resistance. Maybe it's capacitance. Maybe it's something else. But there's some signal that we can measure between those two terminals. And that signal responds to touch. If our sensor makes contact with the outside world, that signal changes. And we can measure that change. OK, and now imagine that instead of having two terminals embedded in my sensor, I actually have n of these terminals. So this means that that signal, whatever signal it is, I can measure it between any pair of terminals. In this very simple example, in this sketch, I have four terminals, which gives me six unique signals because I can measure my signal. Again, maybe it's resistance, maybe it's capacitance between any pair of terminals. Uh, and the idea then is that if you take this approach, then the number of signals that you get is quadratic in the number of terminals because you are measuring the signal between any two terminals. So another way to think about it is that there is a lot of crosstalk between all of these signals. They all have overlapping receptive areas. Uh, but this idea of using overlapping signals uh, and you know, having a quadratic uh, cardinality of the signal set in the number of terminals gives us this very, very rich uh, data set that I was talking about that somehow uh, characterizes the, the touch that's happening on our sensor. So this is the general idea of, uh, of the overlapping signals. Uh, in terms of concrete implementations, we started off with resistance being the signal that we measured. So we have a piezoresistive sensor, uh, and we measure changes in resistance between two terminals. That was good as a proof of concept, but incredibly difficult to manufacture. Hysteresis was a big problem. So then eventually we moved from resistance to actually using light transport as the underlying sensing mechanism. Uh, so we, from, we went from piezoresistive sensor to an optical sensor. And in an optical sensor, our terminals are either LEDs or photodiodes. So let me show you how that works. So what you're seeing here is our very first uh, optical sensor, which was flat, so planar. But then we quickly moved to 3D, which is what we wanted to do all along, to build fingers. Uh, so imagine that this is a cross section through one of our uh, fingers. We have a 3D printed skeleton, which is shown here in gray. So that's just 3D printed. Uh, we have a whole bunch of LEDs and photodiodes that are uh, embedded in, in, the, in the sensor. And there is a transparent uh, rubber, transparent urethane layer, PDMS, that essentially acts as a waveguide. And the whole thing is coated by a reflective layer so that light that's generated inside the finger stays inside the finger and we also don't get outside light coming in. So you can imagine, for example, that one thing we can do is we can measure light from the blue photodiode shown here to the red, uh, sorry, from the, the blue LED 
to the red photodiode next to it. And if this finger makes contact with anything and deforms because of that, then that amount, the light that gets from that LED to the photodiode changes, and that's a signal we can measure. Uh, at the same time, we can measure light from the same LED to a different photodiode, or from the LED all the way on the right to the photodiode all the way on the left. Uh, and in general, we can measure the amount of light that goes from each individual LED built into our finger to each individual photodiode. How we distinguish between different signals and different LEDs, uh, not going to go into, into some of those details right now, but in general, the idea is exactly that, that we are measuring how much light goes from each LED to every photodiode. Inside this waveguide, this transparent waveguide that's about seven millimeters thick, where we are trapping light uh, inside of our finger. Uh, and in general, we have a whole bunch of these signals because we have many LEDs and many photodiodes. Uh, in fact, in the version of the finger that we are building that we're using right now, we have about 30 LEDs and 30 photodiodes. Uh, all the way on the left, you see the, the skeleton, the 3D printed skeleton. And then on top of that is a flexible circuit board designed uh, in, in John Kimisis's lab. In fact, Keith Berman, who is the, 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 the person who took the lead and, and designed that, that, that circuit board is in the audience today. If I zoom in enough, you can even see his name right here where it says the Clue Lab underneath here, it says Keith Berman. So he designed this flexible circuit board, which has 30, some 30 LEDs, about 30 LEDs and 30 photodiodes. Then in the middle, you see what it looks like with the PDMS waveguide, so the transparent layer added on top. And then all the way on the right, you see what it looks like with the skin, with the reflective skin on top, which keeps inside light in and keeps outside light out. Uh, and since we are measuring the a signal from each LED to each photodiode, we get a total of a thousand something signals, all of which are sensitive to deformations of this finger in response to touch. Uh, and the things that we're excited about here is that it is a very rich signal set. Uh, the hemispherical tip of the finger is fully sensorized, no blind spots. And the cylindrical body of the finger, most of it is also sensorized. So 190 degrees around the circumference are also sensorized. So it gives us that coverage of curved surfaces, very rich signal set. And then thanks to the multiplexing that we do, that is just a single uh, FCC connector that allows us to read all of that, just one wire, the one you see in the photo, that's all. And of course, you know, thanks to light, there is indeed a certain, uh, you know, just uh, it, it, it looks good. Uh, so uh, thank you for, you know, your comments on the design uh, in, in, in the Q&A. We always joke that, you know, if this whole robotics thing doesn't pan out, this finger has a future in holiday ornaments or, or something like that. Or, you know, we scale it up and it becomes a, a disco, a giant disco ball. Um, okay, so we get this very rich signal set. We get a good coverage. What's the catch? There's always a catch. And the catch is that those signals are incredibly difficult or impossible to interpret by a person. So here you see, for example, how our you know, 1,000 signals change in response to our robot finger making contact at some specific location. Many of the signals are unaffected because their receptive area has nothing to do with where the finger is being touched right now. And then some signals go up because more light hits the respective photodiode from the respective LED. Some signals go down. It's a very rich signal set. There's a lot of information there, but it's essentially impossible to tease out the, that information just via human analysis. Uh, except that we never really intended this data for human consumption. We always knew that what we want to do with this raw, very rich 
signal set coming out of our finger is to have it be ingested uh, via machine learning algorithms. And of course, we live in the age of, of machine learning and all kinds of different machine learning modalities. So uh, how can we you know, make sense and extract useful information out of this incredibly rich signal set that, that we're getting from the finger? And uh, the first thing that we tried was to do it via supervised machine learning. Uh, so basically what's happening here is that we are collecting training data from our robot finger. You can see the finger being poked uh, by a robot arm. And the key here is that it's being poked in very, very highly controlled fashion. Every time we make touch, we make contact with our finger, we know exactly where we are contacting it because our robot arm is very precise. And we also know how much force we are applying because we are using the linear probe. Let me play this again. Uh, we're using a linear probe with a load cell at the tip. So we know exactly where we are making contact with our finger and we know exactly how much force we are applying. Uh, so we are collecting essentially labeled training data that allows us to train a supervised learning model so that we can later learn to predict touch location and contact force from the raw data uh, coming out of the finger. So once we've trained, uh, once we've trained our model, this is, this is what it looks like. So our finger can, can output where touch is happening, how much force is being applied. Um, and it can do it over the entirety, you know, the, all of the hemisphere and uh, a good amount of the cylindrical body, no, no blind spots. And actually this video is at this point, I think about two years old. Uh, so we've improved performance uh, since uh, even more, although it's, it's not really noticeable anymore with, with the naked eye. Uh, it's funny, it's, it's two years that since we did this video, I almost said one year because the pandemic, it's almost like it doesn't count. It fills in the, the brain almost like it's, it's time out of time, but it has been two years, in fact. Um, we have, we've quantified the performance uh, of our fingertip. You know, how, how good is it at uh, localizing touch? And we can localize touch in general with sub millimeter accuracy almost over the, entire circum over the entire surface area of the finger, especially for higher forces. We can also uh, identify the normal force being applied in general with 10% or even less with 5% with 5% error. Uh, so uh, there is a question of, uh, can we handle multiple simultaneous touches uh, or torque? That's uh, excellent questions. For multiple touches, uh, we, we can, if we train for that. And we've shown in the paper that it's possible. However, of course, collecting training data for multiple touches is a lot more difficult. Now, all of a sudden you need an instrumented setup where you touch the finger in multiple places, you know where touch is happening, you are recording maybe the force as well. So it's much, much more difficult. And the information is there in the, in the raw data but to get it out via supervised learning, you have to train for it, which is very difficult. And I'll get back to that point in just a little bit. Uh, in terms of torque, uh, there's a very good point. And there's also not just torque, but other forces, you know, shear forces. Here we are training for normal force. Can we detect shear forces? Can we detect, you know, frictional torque being applied? Uh, and we haven't trained for that. We haven't uh, quantified that yet. We have right now a study going on to see if we can predict the net wrench, meaning force and torque resultant at the base of the finger. Uh, we don't yet know how, how well we're gonna be able to do that. It's possible that things like frictional torque and shear forces, we won't do as well as we do with normal force just because, I mean, ultimately we're sensing deformation. Deformation is our proxy for force and shear force is likely to induce less deformation than normal force and the same for frictional torque. So it's possible that we won't do as, as well. And that's where, you know, we're still kind of falling short of the human fingertip, which is very good at, at detecting shear. 
So you know, we'll, we'll, we'll see where we end up. But this is the, the fundamental limitation of training via supervised learning that you can only detect things that you've trained for and that you have ground truth label data for. And uh, we'll get back to that in just a little bit. OK, um, what are we doing right now with these fingers? We never really wanted to build just tactile things, just tactile sensors by themselves. We are roboticists. Our goal was always to build robots using, you know, equipped with a sense of touch. So we've been building hands, uh, dexterous robot hands equipped with our tactile fingers. The one on the left has tactile sensing on both finger links. So all, all three fingers, the proximal and the distal link. And it also has proprioception, meaning torque sensing at every joint. So not contact torque, but joint torque sensing. I think it is the most heavily sensorized uh, dexterous hand, robotic hand in the world. Uh, except that with complexity comes difficulty of construction and maintenance. So it's proven difficult to get to a level of robustness where we can do lots of experiments with it. On the right hand side, you see a hand that is somewhat simpler. It only has tactile sensing on the distal links of every finger, because the proximal link is just a servo. Uh, and it has no torque sensing at the joints. So it's a lot less sensorized, but so much easier to build. No torque sensing and only tactile sensing on the distal link and much more robust to running lots of experiments. And we are very actively working with both of these hands to use the tactile data that we're getting to see if we can uh, acquire complex motor skills. Uh, here's an example of what that would look like, um, the kind of motor skill that would be looking to demonstrate. This ability to do in-hand manipulation uh, via finger gating of arbitrary objects and also while holding the object under gravity without losing it. Uh, and that's the a kind of motor skill that's never been demonstrated, uh, which is you know, part of, of what's so exciting about it. And uh, we've been able to, to make good progress so far in simulation. What you're seeing here is a manipulation policy learned in simulation. Uh, the, what, the, the method underneath is model free reinforcement learning. I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about RL later in the talk. I'm sure many of you are familiar with the general RL concept. Here, the input to the policy from each finger is exactly contact location and normal force. So each finger reports if contact is happening. And then if so, what's the location of contact and what's the normal force? And you see the massive advantage of having fingers that are completely sensorized all around that, are, that have no blind spots. Uh, one of the catches here is that you know this uh, train is trained in simulation because it requires massive, massive amounts of training data. I'm sure you know, some of you are familiar with the idea that model free reinforcement learning is very powerful, but also very sample inefficient. It needs incredible amounts of training data. So a policy like this takes you know, 30 simulated days of continuous practice. And of course, when you are you know, just developing the methods, you need to train many, 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 many policies. Uh, and it's just infeasible on, on real hardware. In simulation, we can parallelize the process. So this can train overnight in a simulator. But then of course, there's a lot of work involved in taking a policy that's been trained inside a simulator and deploying it to a real hand. And that's very much you know, ongoing active work uh, in our lab. Uh, another thing that we're doing in the lab is uh, working to see if we can recognize objects via touch. And again, this is ongoing work. Um, you know, this being sort of a Columbia seminar, I, I felt free to just, you know, here's an unvarnished look at things that are just going on right now that we're just starting to explore. So here I know come toy problems where in simulation, we have a tactile finger that's exploring uh, an object, simple shapes for now, we're gonna get to more complex stuff soon. And again, the finger provides, the tactile finger provides the contact location. 
And then we are building a map of what the, the agent has seen and trying to simultaneously train a discriminator that can recognize the object based on this tactile information. And this is a joint work with Shuran Song's lab. Um, so these are just you know, two examples of the things that we we're looking to do with this very rich and unique tactile data that we're getting. Um, but uh, there are two, there's a thing that these approaches have in common. So uh, again, the raw data from our finger consists of these, you know, let's say 1000 signals that we collect at about, at about 60 Hertz. And, you know, a lot of work went into uh, the flex board design, you know, by Keith and then by, by Pedro in our lab to get it to the point where we can sample so fast that we can collect all 1000 signals at 60 Hertz. And we believe we can push that even higher, but for now we're, we're, we're okay with 60 Hertz. But for many of these algorithms, you know, uh, training these policies, that's a, a very high dimensional signal. Of course, it's not as high dimensional as vision, for example, but that's still a lot of data. So what we're doing right now is we're taking this raw data from the finger and putting it through the tactile model that's trained via supervised learning. And that model is outputting contact location and normal force, which is obviously a lot less data than the raw, just, just in terms of you know, the dimensionality of the space. It's just contact location is you know, three variables normal force is another three variables. And in fact, even two, since it's uh, with the direction is, is, is known, right? So uh, we are using the supervised model to extract the, the information that we need, but we're also throwing out a lot of data in the process. Furthermore, this tactile model trained via supervised learning has to be needs labeled ground truth data for training, which right now we collect via the, our instrument. It's set up with a robot that's time consuming, it's limiting. Uh, you know, we uh, had the question earlier from Steve about multi-touch. This is, you know, this supervised model is constraining us in terms of what we can train. So we would very much love to go to where we have a, a model in between that's either unsupervised or self-supervised and extracts the key information out of that raw data, reduces the dimensionality of the raw signal to the point where it can be ingested by whatever motor learning or motor controller we want to use. Uh, and it still preserves the information that's useful for, for manipulation. And exactly how that's going to happen, we don't know yet. It's again, very active work in our lab. And that's work that Emily is leading. And she's looking at all kinds of things ranging from, you know, autoencoders to learning forward models, embeddings, learning embeddings and latent spaces, uh, leaving no stone unturned. But this is kind of the, the, the duality that we have right now in the lab. You know, are we using, we're using this, the data both in a supervised fashion to see if we can acquire complex motor skills. And we are looking into unsupervised or self-supervised uh, models to use the same raw, very rich tactile data for, for various motor skills. Uh, okay, so that is the, the first part of the talk where I focus specifically on the sensing and its interplay with, with the rest of the mechanism, the rest of the system. Uh, but as I was saying at the beginning, uh, for robotic motor skills, sensing is just one part of the puzzle. There is a lot more to it. Uh, and we look at, at all of these components and there is another one that I wanted to talk about today because it's, it's very interesting uh, and kind of related to the mission of the, you know, the, the Data Science Institute and our center in that it's using data-driven methods for things that traditionally haven't been done in, in data-driven fashion. And in particular, we're looking at actuation and kinematics. Can we optimize the kinematics and the actuation of the manipulator uh, in novel ways, leveraging kind of recent advances in, in data-driven methods and learning methods. Uh, so this part on, on actuation and kinematics uh, is actually driven by a very concrete use case. 
uh, we're working with the folks at, at NASA and NASA Ames Research Center, and they've developed the Astrobee robot, the blue, the cute blue little robot that you can see in these images. Uh, there are two Astrobees actually on the space station right now. The Astrobee is an assistive free flyer. It's meant to float around the space station. It has a, a system of impalers, so it can it can fly around. Originally, just as a monitoring platform, it can read instruments uh, and monitor things on the space station. But we would very much love to see if we can equip the Astro B also with manipulation abilities. Can we make it a reasonably versatile manipulator so that potentially one day the Astro B could be you know, helpful as a manipulator uh, in orbit? And we've already taken some steps in that direction. Uh, here you see a rendering of a, a, a little gripper. It's called the perching gripper because the Astro B uses it to grab onto handrails. Uh, and the Astro B on the space station is already equipped with these perching grippers that are based for, on a design from our lab. So about six years ago, we designed uh, this gripper in the lab. We open sourced the design and then the folks at NASA Ames took the design and flight certified it and integrated it with the avionics. And right now the Astrobees in, in, in orbit have these perching grippers that, and we're anxiously waiting for them to be commissioned. But we'd love for uh, the Astrobee to have a more versatile manipulator, one that could interact with a wide range of objects. Uh, you know, what kind of objects, what kind of things could uh, the Astrobee be expected to manipulate in orbit? This is where we were incredibly lucky to have an astronaut, a former NASA astronaut in our department, talking of course about Mike Massimino, the first person to tweet from space, one of the folks who fixed the Hubble telescope. <coughs> so uh, he helped us a lot with you know, case studies and we came up with a range of objects that you could expect the astrobe to need to manipulate. And then based on that, we arrived at a hand design, three fingers, eight joints that give us the range of uh, grasping capabilities that we need. But once again, there is a catch, right? Uh, a hand with eight joints has an eight dimensional posture space. And every dimension of the posture space corresponds to the value of one of the eight joints. And that's my best attempt to put an eight dimensional space on a, on a two dimensional slide. And then every hand posture, every hand shape corresponds to one point in this eight dimensional posture space. So if you have a range, a bunch of objects that you'd like to grasp, each of those grasps corresponds to one point in this eight dimensional posture space. So you'd like the hand to be able to execute all of these grasps identified by those points in posture space. But there's no way that you will outfit a hand with eight motors, one for each joint, and still have it fit inside the payload bay of the astrobe. The payload bay of the astrobe is about 10 by 10 by 10 centimeters. You're not going to fit a hand with a large number of motors in there. In fact, you're lucky if you can get one motor or maybe at most two motors in the palm of the hand and have it still fit in the payload bay. So the hand will have to be massively underactuated. Um, so here is a sketch of an underactuated design that is a single motor that is connected via cables, we call them tendons, that's connected via tendons, the tendons are shown in red to all the joints. So one motor, three tendons, actuating all the eight joints of the hand. So heavily underactuated design, that's how you get it to fit inside the payload bay. But then what happens? Once you introduce underactuation like this, because you only have a single motor, the hand can no longer access the entirety of its posture space. It only has access to some low dimensional manifold inside of that posture space because uh, of underactuation. So what we did is we came up with some new methods uh, to optimize the parameters of the transmission, so things like pulley radii uh, or spring stiffnesses or spring preload levels. 
to essentially shape the manifold and hit all the grasps that, that we care about. And these method, methods were, were data-driven in, in nature. I'm, I'm gonna skip some of the details, but this is what, uh, for example, the very, very first prototype looked like before we even put a motor on it. You can see that it's just hand actuated, but uh, there is a single motor and then the hand has this nice synergies where it executes all the grasps that we care about. And then the fingers kind of get out of each other's way so that it can also envelop small things. And our novel optimization methods ensure not just that we can shape the fingers the way we'd like to, but also that each grasp is stable. Is in, you know, there's force equilibrium because ultimately grasping is, is, a, is a force equilibrium question. Uh, so that was the very, very first prototype that we built kind of as a proof of concept. Uh, then pretty soon afterwards, we actually went ahead and put a motor on it. So you can see it with a single motor it gets this synergistic behavior that we like as a result of us shaping this manifold. We call it the mechanically realizable manifold to get uh, all the grasps and also get all the grasps to be kinematically and, and to be stable from a force perspective. Uh, and this is uh, one of uh, our earlier prototypes doing integration testing with a flat sat Astro B uh, ground unit over at NASA Ames. You can see that the, the ground unit is on a granite table because they want to simulate microgravity. So here we're integrating with the avionics and all that. This prototype wasn't quite small enough to fit in the payload bay, but the one that we just finished building a few months ago is. Uh, and um, we're, 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 one thing that we'd love to do next is to see if we can get this hand to be flight certified and, and send it up into orbit to join the two astrobies which are up there, which would be just uh, fantastic. And we're, we're really hoping that that can happen. But we haven't stopped the research because uh, there was still something that was kind of bothering us about this approach, which is that the hardware design and the hardware optimization was, was automated, but the target grasps were chosen via human input. And that was is just an instance of this disconnect that just seems to be pervasive in the field between the optimization of the hardware, which is often referred to as design, and the optimization of the software, which often people refer to it as planning or learning. And you know, oftentimes you'll have some folks, typically the mechanical engineers, build the hardware and then just kind of you know throw it over the wall to some other people, typically the computer scientists, and say, now you people take it and program it. And then they blame each other when, when it doesn't work. And in our lab, we are both. We are mechanical engineers and we are computer scientists. So we have nobody to blame. So we better you know, make, it, make it work. Can we bridge this disconnect between hardware optimization and software optimization? And to do that, we started from uh, some methods for software optimization that are incredibly popular right now, essentially revolutionizing our field and not just our field, and that's the reinforcement learning, deep reinforcement learning. Uh, so let me just kind of to build this from the ground up, I'll just walk you through the, the, the basics of what a reinforcement learning framework looks like. I'm sure many of you are familiar with that, so forgive me if these are things that you know already very, very well. But basically what happens in reinforcement learning is that you have a policy and the job of the policy is to take in observations, presumably collected by the sensors. And the policy has to spit out an action in the form, usually in the form of motor commands. Uh, and then those motor commands get sent to the robot. The robot does something, interacts with the world. The world evolves into the next state, and then the whole cycle recommences. The policy you know, gets fed the observations and spits out an, an, an action. And with deep reinforcement learning, the policy is represented as a deep neural network, which is, of course is an instance of a computational graph. Usually in robotic motor skill learning, it's a, it's a multi-layer perceptron, doesn't really matter. It's a, it's a deep neural network. Uh, the deep neural network has a number of parameters, you know, weights and biases. I'm sure many of you are familiar with that. So fundamentally, the goal of policy optimization is to optimize the parameters of your policy 
such that it spits out good actions. It does the right thing in response to the observations that it gets. And we have a wealth of very powerful methods developed over the last, you know, maybe five years or even three years for doing policy optimization. And the key here is that uh, a, a deep neural network, of course, is auto differentiable. So you can compute the gradient of the action with respect to the policy parameters. And that allows you to do many optimization algorithms that, you know, it's a very rich field. It would take an entire semester long course to, to discuss all of them. But this is what we are starting from here. This idea that you can optimize a policy. But note that in this model, the robot, the hardware itself is completely external to the policy. The policy spits out motor commands. And then as far as it's concerned, the physical body of the robot is part of the outside world. It has no, uh, no bearing on that. It just produces motor commands. And as I was alluding to earlier, these methods, while very, very powerful, tend to need too much training time to be feasible on, on, to, to train on real hardware. So uh, in the last couple of years, folks have realized that you can actually train them on a simulator, on, this, on a general purpose black box physics simulator. And we now have very powerful methods to train the policy on a simulated robot. Uh, but then still have it transfer to the real world. After you finish training on a simulator, you can take the policy, use it on a real robot, and it works. And again, this is in itself, it's a very rich topic for discussion, but that's not where we were looking to make our contribution. What we said was that, look, now with the robot being inside this general purpose black box physics simulator, this gives us a unique opportunity to optimize the hardware along with the software, along with the computational policy. Uh, and the way we can do that is we can break the simulation of the robot into two. Part of the robot hardware, we are simulating as a computational graph. Uh, and we call that the hardware policy. And then the rest of the hardware stays in the general purpose black box physics simulator that we don't care what it has under the hood. Uh, and we, we, we redefine what an action is to be the output of the hardware policy that we're simulating. Uh, and then that part of the hardware also has its own hardware parameters, things that you know, affect change how the robot is constructed. So to give you a concrete example, to convince you that hardware actually can look like a policy, right? I'm going back to the example of the underactuated hand. The computational policy takes in observations and produces motor commands. The motor generates some force, but then the transmission, you know, the tendons, the transmission takes as input the motor force and converts that into joint torques. That's what a transmission does. In your car, a transmission takes engine torque and converts it to wheel torque, right? In a hand, a transmission takes as input actuator forces or torques and converts it to joint torques. It takes an input, it spits out an output, it's characterized by parameters it's, the, it's, its behavior is governed by parameters such as you know, pulley radii and springs and stuff like that. And if we can simulate our transmission as a computational graph, which is auto differentiable, and it turns out that you can, then we can optimize the parameters of the hardware transmission in the same optimization loop as the parameters of the computational policy and in perfectly analogous fashion. So whatever deep reinforcement learning, you know, policy optimization algorithms we used before just for the computational policy, we can now use for the computational policy and the hardware policy, and now they are being optimized together. And thankfully, there are off-the-shelf algorithms for policy optimization, open source that we can just take and use, and we don't need to write to write our own. And after we finished optimizing the hardware and the software in this, in this manner, using this machine reinforcement learning method, then, uh, so it's, it, there's a joint gradient propagating through both. 
we this is what it looks like before we optimize the hardware the the tendon transmission is just random you you never you, you don't get nice stable forces of course after you finish the optimization you have beautiful equilibrium for a range of objects we've shown in the paper that we are a lot more efficient than you know evolutionary strategies or other alternative gradient free methods um the thing that we care about the most is that we can then transfer the results to the real world. We can take the, the transmission parameters, here's a tendon pulley radius, radius, and we can give them physical instantiation in the real world. Here's a joint spring that we've optimized the stiffness for. Uh, and then we can combine that with the computational policy and it works, it transfers into the, into the real world. Uh, we have a question, will this potentially replace manufacturing and design tolerances as the parameters that specify uncertainty in hardware design? I think this general idea of optimizing hardware parameters and computational policies together can, it can be incredibly powerful. And uh, would we use it for tolerances and things like that? Maybe, absolutely, you know, because then you are, you know, the, the higher, the, the, the better the tolerance is. We can think of it this way. If you have a more precise mechanism because it has better tolerances, it makes the software job easier. If your mechanism is less precise, then the software needs to compensate. And, and that's generally done, you know, sequentially. What if we, if we did this in a single optimization loop then we could find this kind of global sweet spot of how much do we need to invest in better precision at the mechanical level and how much can we compensate for in software. And of course, you know, it sounds like a pipe dream, but I think we're just seeing the very beginning uh, of something that is likely to be very, very powerful. I mean, hardware software co-optimization is not a new idea. And, you know, for example, at, at, at Columbia, you know, another one of my colleagues in my department is Hod Lipson, who was one of the early pioneers of this idea of evolutionary algorithms for both hardware and software. It's a, and of course, that's how nature works. And we know that. We, and, and, uh, and we see all the time incredible examples in nature of hardware and software optimized with and for each other uh, via evolution and that being such a powerful paradigm. And as a field, we've been trying to do that as well, but we've been hitting roadblocks and some of those roadblocks got shattered away by the last five years. You know, what happened in the last five years? We now have good multi-body dynamic simulators and more importantly, they are easy to use and open source and off the shelf. You just take them and you run them and they are robust, reasonably robust, and they just run. So you can do dynamic simulation. And critically, folks have figured out how to do sim to real, how to optimize something in simulation and then have it transfer to the real world. The keyword there is domain randomization, super interesting topic, but we don't really have the time to get into it. Uh, the other thing that has happened in the last maybe five years, cloud computing. Any of us, you know, every research lab has access to massive parallel computing resources. And we've had this explosion of, you know, deep reinforcement learning that works very, very well for learning skills in partially observable worlds. All of these have come, have happened maybe in the last five years or so. And to me, they point to just an, a, the beginning of a new golden age for hardware and software co-optimization. What can we optimize about the hardware? And right now we cannot optimize everything. You know, the, the, the catch here is that in order for our method, you know, we call it hardware as policy. In order for it to work, we need to simulate the hardware as an auto-differentiable computational graph. Not everything can be simulated as an auto-differentiable computational graph. So, uh, there is still a tremendous amount of research to be done, but I think uh, we're, I'm, I'm very excited about what the future holds, this idea of data-driven simultaneous evolution of hardware and software. Uh, I'm almost out of time. I just have one more project that I wanted to mention in case anybody's interested. It's a kind of a complete change of pace and a collaboration with the rehabilitation medicine department at the medical school. We're very, very lucky to have this close collaboration with with the folks up at, uh, at, at the medical school. And we're looking to build a hand orthosis for stroke patients, a robotic hand orthosis for stroke patients. Uh, particularly what we're looking at is 
a very common after effect of stroke, which is excessive muscle tone and spasticity, where the flexor muscles are, uh, are, are always contracted and the hand is kind of clenched in a fist at all times. So these folks have no trouble closing the hand. The problem is opening the hand so you can grasp something or let it go. Uh, and that's the orthosis that we've built with a single motor assisting extension for all digits. And then just lots and lots of sensors. Um, and a big part of this work, of course, is uh, using machine learning or anything, but usually it ends up being machine learning. So that <laughs> based on all of our sensors, we can infer what the person is trying to do. So we need to understand when the person wants to open their hand so that we can provide assistance. And then when they want to close the hand, uh, our orthosis lets go and allows their flexor muscles, which are still you know, very strong, to close the hand so that they can, they can grasp and release. And we're doing a lot of work uh, in, uh, with, on, on this orthosis. We've, we've looked at the mechanical design, of course, but then this very complex and interesting problem of intent inferral using multimodal data. And right now we have electromyography on the orthosis. We have pressure sensors. We've actually moved away from the bend sensors. This is a bit old. We have uh, IMUs now in the fingertips so we can measure voluntary movement. Uh, but this is again, very, very related to the mission of our center, which is to sense, uh, move and, uh, and collect data and a project that we're, uh, we're, we're very actively involved in. Okay, so with that, uh, I don't wanna I don't wanna go over time, but just to kind of bring it all together, uh, if there's one thing that I'm hoping to 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 convince you of today is that when you're looking at motor skills and complex motor skills, intelligence can reside everywhere, and that's something that I deeply believe. And uh, you know, yes, everybody says intelligence is at, at the at the planning or learning level, um, but I think there's real intelligence in, in the kinematics and in the actuation, the mechanism. And then there's intelligence in the sensing. And especially the interplay of these is opening up all new kinds of possibilities. The fact that we have these machine learning methods and you know, data processing methods opens up sensing modalities that otherwise we wouldn't have been able to use. So the, the learning methods changes the nature of the sensors that you're building. The sensors then in turn change the nature of the learning methods you use. There's this wonderful interplay. And I think uh, ultimately what we're trying to, everything we do boils down to can, where should we put intelligence so that we get the most bang for the buck. And so that from the interplay between all of these components and intelligence in all of these components, we get robust behaviors in, in complex environments. Uh, with that, just want to acknowledge the, the wonderful uh, lab members and collaborators that, uh, that have done all the work here. This is a very recent lab photo from these socially distanced times. And uh, thank you very much for your attention. Oh, thank you, Matei. This is the most remarkable talk. It was uh, full of very useful, very interesting material. Thank you. And I'll, I'll be very happy to take uh, more questions, either, you know, unmute, you know, raise your hand and, and, and uh, unmute and ask, or just type them either in the Q&A or in the chat. For contact, the best thing uh, is just shoot me an email. Uh, my address is on the Columbia Engineering website and on the lab website. That's by far the best method. So just to get the ball rolling, can I just ask a question, Matei? Sure. Uh, so, you know, the role of uh, dynamical models in this context that you describe is there, uh, presumably in the cultural graph. Uh, let me be a little more specific. Uh, you know, controllers and dynamics as we know it uh, is characterized by memory. So uh, memory that evolves, right? Uh, that has dynamics associated. Where is that reflected? Uh, or is there, I know this is a talk for the Data Science Institute, but uh, so maybe it's there, but not entirely visible. Uh, where would you uh, uh, focus on to see 
where this hybrid nature, the interaction of uh, machine learning and uh, dynamics comes in? I would say that the interaction and you know the role of analytical models versus purely data-driven learned models, that's the great debate of our time in robotics. It is the, yeah, the, this big tension between these two fields between, you know, I'm gonna write the equations of motion and I'm gonna solve them and I'm gonna write a feedback controller based on that versus uh, I'm just going to take whatever action worked best the last time I saw this situation, right? Uh, is, is one approach better than the other? Can you combine them and get the best of both worlds? Yeah, that's the big question of our time in robotics, maybe more than anything else. So um, we're, we're trying to do both in the lab. And, uh, you know, just, I, 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 I don't have a lot of quantitative answers at this point. It's such a complicated question. But some things that we're seeing, you know, informally is that combining these two approaches is harder than it would seem. It would seem that, yes, you know, there are things that we know analytically, so let's use that to kind of guide our learning models. And that's hard because as soon as you start injecting some bias of any sort into these learning models, you strip them of their power to learn and to explore. So it's, it's, it's a very non-trivial problem. Uh, in terms of memory, that's also a very interesting question. A lot of our systems uh, and a lot of the methods used these days are based on the Markovian assumption that everything you need to know is in your current state. You don't need anything from the past. Even though we know that for many of these, the Markovian assumption doesn't, doesn't hold. Uh, for, for the data-driven approaches, people are often using uh, deep neural networks with memory. So recurrent neural networks of some sort to give them that additional uh, you know, insight into the past. Uh, and, and, and then you can think of it as the policy, if it has access to multiple time steps of information, it can use those to infer something about the world and, and act appropriately. So uh, on the data-driven side, for memory, people will use recurrence, for example, or use just multiple time steps of information as input, as input to the policy. On the analytical side, it's, it's, it's hard to, to, to use many, many time steps. You know, uh, things, uh, oftentimes, you know, things that are, you know, the gold standard, like, you know, the Kalman filter or an extended Kalman filter, you know, I think, you know, Kalman was a few doors down from your office in the double E department at Columbia, right? Um, e even those rely on the Markovian assumption. So um, it's, it's hard to integrate memory, but it's something people are very actively looking at. I, 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 I'm sorry that I don't have anything more specific, but you have essentially identified two of the critical problems that the entire field is working on. Uh, let me see, we have a, a, a couple of questions uh, in the chat. So hardware-software collaborations uh, have a great impact. Uh, are there any key players in, in industry for hardware and software collaborations? Um, that's a great question. And in industry, folks oftentimes have the advantage of they own the entire stack. So they, they have the hardware and they have the software. But, you know, the, the disadvantage is that you don't get a lot of insight into what they're doing. Um, I don't know off the top of my head of places in industry where they would actually do formal co-optimization. I'm sure that there's informal co-optimization that happens. You know, uh, Waymo builds its autonomous cars at the same time as the, the, the driver, the, the, the controllers and the policies. So I'm sure that many, many times they've iterated back and forth between what the software team said would be useful in terms of sensing and what the hardware team could deliver. But I don't know off the top of my head of places where you would formally co-optimize the hardware and the software in a joint loop. And I think that's a very powerful paradigm that is coming, that's happening, at least for some problems. You cannot optimize any hardware 
in simulation, of course. So, but you're always going to be limited by what you can simulate reasonably well. But I think it's 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 happening. Uh, another question: Have you been able to use the finger to distinguish textures by stroking them? Ah, that's also a very good question. Uh, one thing we've looked at there is. So when you move your finger across a textured surface, you get these wonderful vibrations in your finger that tell you a lot about texture. Those are uh, very high frequency events. And uh, even you know at 60 Hertz and with the deformations that we get, our current finger isn't designed for or, or well equipped for these very, very high frequency events. Uh, one thing that we looked into doing and, and Keith, uh, is Keith still still there? I think Keith uh, signed out. So Keith from John Chemistis's lab, he was looking into piezoelectric materials. So PVDF, using uh, PVDF as a piezoelectric material. Uh, so that will give you a beautiful fast response to fast stimuli, uh, but then that dissipates. So piezoelectricity is not good at maintained uh, signals, at low, slow acting signals. So he and John developed these PVDF sensors that will give you wonderful texture information. And then you can use machine learning on top of that to try to identify which specific texture it is. Uh, for our finger, one thing we'd like to do in the next iteration is either integrate the PVDF uh, piezoelectric sensors that they've built, or maybe put vibration sensors, you know, microphones inside of the PDMS or IMUs, add another sensing modality specifically for fast acting stimuli and that should help us with uh, with texture it's uh it's something that we'd very much like to do uh another question are you also working on optimizing the sensors absolutely and uh again it's such a powerful paradigm to say uh, i should only have in hardware the sensors that my policy actually makes use of i shouldn't just throw in all of these sensors that complicate my design and my manufacturing if my policy doesn't need them. And the one way to do that is to optimize your policy and your sensing apparatus together in a way that says, you know, all else being equal, I'd rather have fewer sensors than more. So I want my policy to be as capable as possible, but all else being equal, try to reduce the number of sensors. In, in learning parlance, that's a form of regularization. And uh, that's something that we're getting off the ground using our hardware as policy approach for uh, optimizing the sensing suite. We, and we hope that it'll be a, a powerful paradigm. Any, any other questions, either you know, in chat or, or Q&A or just voice? A quick one, Matei. Uh, you know, this when you were talking about the underactuated, you know, the eight motors, but you could only have space for one of them. Uh, you, you know, that manifold uh, <laughs> reminded me of questions of controllability. You know, how to design uh, controllable systems, and uh, is that kind of concept uh, from control theory kick in at all? Is it... it is absolutely, and. Uh... Yeah, because the the under under actuate under actuated mechanisms have controllability constraints, and that's true in hands, but it's true in in, in anything in you know in in uh, helicopters and in rockets. I mean, there are many under actuated systems beyond hands, and there's the the control systems approach to that as well. Uh, and you know. If, if, if we were to use that too, I think it would allow us to also look at more subtle effects at which we're not looking at right now to also think about what happens, you know, the hand is kind of moving on that manifold. What if it's externally perturbed exactly. and taken away from the manifold? You know, is, is that manifold stable also in the control theory sense? Does it return to the manifold? And those are things we haven't looked at and we just don't take into consideration uh, and using some of the apparatus of controllability might allow us to do that. Yes. Very good. Well, you know, it's just been the most fascinating talk. So unless there's another question, uh, I just want to thank you, Matei, and uh, we'll have to have you back so, <laughs> in, in due course. Thank you so much, Debasis, and thank you to everyone for, uh, for being here this afternoon. Thank you. Bye. Thank you all. Bye.